Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us um, or listening to the session after it's been recorded. Uh, uh, I'm Sanjeev Sethi, and you can't see me. Um, and I'm the president of the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and I'm excited to have you all attend this uh, this brief yet really weighty topic on uh, educating beyond national identity through the arts. Uh, I'm really fortunate to have uh, four panelists with me that all represent really diverse vantage points for this important topic. And um, obviously, um, as our minds and thoughts are with the armed conflict that's going on in Ukraine, it's hard for us to not go ahead and imagine how this new geopolitical dimension also kind of shapes our thoughts um, about issues regarding border and nationalism uh, um, and its re relationship to creativity uh, and cultural development um, itself. So uh, I'll speak a little bit about the um, um, the the um, the topic, um, and, but really I kind of want to get to the opportunity for uh, my uh, colleagues to go ahead and introduce themselves um, and um and introduce themselves and really talk more about their vantage point as to how they see this idea uh, of uh, educating beyond national ide ideology. Um, uh, I would say that um, in particular, uh, yeah. And so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go to introducing our panelists. We've got uh, Annie Abigail, um, who uh, who's an artist and I can go ahead and put her website in the chat box. Um, whose work has been shown nationally and internationally, and most recently at such venues like the Headlands, uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the Arts Prospects Festival in St. Petersburg, Russia, Trash 3 uh, Festival uh, in Kyrgyzstan, um, uh, um, and beyond. Uh, she's currently also an affiliate artist in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts uh, in California and teaches at Severa, Sierra Nevada College's um, MFA IA program. Um, and, and we're also fortunate to have uh, Alana uh, Rosati Laforet, a uh, publisher and chief revenue officer of Decrypt USA, uh, and Christian Wagner, um, who's been a visiting research professor in aesthetics uh, and science uh, um, of um, and the science of communication at the University of San Paulo. Uh, and I also will post um, her URL down here as well. Um, and um, and then lastly, Michael Klein is the managing director of Michael Klein Arts uh, USA. So, you know, what I thought we'd do here, um, and again, the goal here is to make sure that we, we feel like we've got enough time to generate um, a conversation, which quite frankly can last way more than 45 minutes. Um, but, but the goal here is to, um, to really have our panelists delve into their own perspectives about this relationship of um, uh, of identity um, uh, um, and um, nation states and its relationship to cultural development. So, um, you know, I think I'll have Annie go first and introduce yourself a little bit more uh, and then talk about your perspective on things. Well, thanks so much, uh, Sanjeet, for the introduction. And it's so wonderful to be here with you guys uh, talking about such an urgent uh, matter, especially given current events. So I am a multimedia artist. Uh, generally, my work explores personal and environmental narratives that are inextricably bound together by different forms of power, such as the government, military, or industry. And my practice is always striving to find new ways to witness a landscape and its relationship to specific human and non-human narratives by examining the cultural context from which they are born and the layers of manipulation that shape how we experience them today. Um, so I do this through many different ways, like sound and video installations, I do this through uh, community-engaged projects, and often with the support of international exchange programs. So most recently, I was in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, with the support of CEC ArtsLink, an amazing organization, um, where I was responding to a Soviet era dump that's constantly aflame and uh, contributes to some of the worst air quality on the planet right now. And so to introduce my relationship to this topic around national ideology and borders, I want to give some context to where my studio is located um, and the recent veins of my artistic research practice. I'm currently an artist in residence, like Sanji mentioned, at the Headland Center for the Arts, and this uh, art center is located within a former military base that's been turned into a national park. It lies directly across from San Francisco, across the Golden Gate Bridge. And when you walk throughout the headlands, what you encounter is an abundance of military infrastructure that is built throughout the landscape. Um, you'll find decommissioned 
Nike missile sites, radar and launch control centers. These are all very obvious intrusions, but what you also might find are more subtle intrusions like the introduction of ice plants in Monterey, Cyprus that have big effects on the local ecology there. And as I was, I've been working there since 2020. And as I spend more and more time there, I feel very incited by this landscape. And it um, sort of pushes me to ask questions around like, what are the origins of nationalism? Because all of these structures are built to defend the nation state. And so I started by reading um, Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities, where he addresses what he considers to be the catalyzing force of nationalism's rise throughout the first European nation states. And he theorizes that beginning in the 17th century, it was the newspaper, it was print capitalism and language, um, which flattened language and allowed seemingly disparate citizens access to shared information and fostered uh, synchronicity and a connection among very disparate citizens. So this led to a question within my practice, which is in what ways are we together beyond the nation state, beyond language? And I wanted to go back to a very elemental uh, form that we are together, which is breath. And Emmanuel Cochia has a beautiful um, essay about this in his book, The Life of Plants, Metaphysics of Mixture, where he posits a world where plants and animals through the production of air and the circulation of breath are so intimately connected because they are both, they both contain and are contained by our shared atmosphere. And he sort of depicts our interdependence through this very fundamental act. So that gave rise to a specific body of work. And right now I'm, I'm expanding this research to look at other ways to witness our interconnections and our interdependence beyond the artificiality of language. So some of the words that might describe this are what Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh calls inter R or inter B, uh, what theorist Karen Barad calls intraaction and Stacey Alemo termed uh, transcorporeality. I think that Donna Haraway says it best, best when she says, uh, to be is always to become with many. And so what all of these words point to is that we come into existence through a series of relationships. And because we're so bound to the living world, which doesn't know anything about na nationalism, ideologies, or borders, um, our health, like our human health and the health of the living world are so interdependent. So that's my stance on things right now. <laughs> I love that. I think I'm next, or so I, I believe. Um, that was a beautiful introduction. Hopefully, if you guys can still see me. I see my internet connection is, you can, okay, great. Um, Alana Roazi Lafare. I come from the, the media and now crypto world. I work in the Web3 space. Decrypt is a Web3 publication. I also run and founded Decrypt Studios, which is a Web3 art studio. We create NFTs and virtual world experiences for our clients, um, and our clients range from photographers, film directors, philosophers, and anything in between. And so when I think about nationalism, I think about it from a, a multifaceted approach, physical and virtual. We're creating a brand new world in the virtual that informs and takes cues from the physical world, but it also is a brand new thing. So that, that's one. And then two, you know, in the crypto space, especially in light of recent events, I think it's important to note that there are no borders in the crypto space. The only borders there are are if a country or countries is, is banning certain exchanges. But at the end of the day, the infrastructure is mostly accessible across the world. And that's really important in light of what's happening in Ukraine, I think is, an, you know, is a good example of folks accessing currency, even if the banks are inaccessible. Um, and also communications across decentralized mechanisms are allowing refugees to leave um, Ukraine, entering into Poland and other countries. And I'm actually a part of a number of them thinking about ways to get people out of the countries. So when I think about art, the art of the possible and art of the possible in web three, it's tied to the fundamental infrastructure of blockchain and decentralized systems, which can enable communication across art, across people, across countries, and across 
new virtual worlds. And so I, I think about all of those things when I think about this topic, because it's no longer just a nation state conversation. That's it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, and, and again, I think there's so much to unpack here. Um, Christian, I think, why don't you go next? Hi. Hi, all. I'm Christiane Wagner. And as I read introduced it, I've been a, a visiting professor, uh, specifically aesthetics at the Contemporary Art Museum, MAC of the University of Sao Paulo. And my research focus is on visual arts and their social political relevance. So I'm also the editor in chief and creative director of Art Style, Art and Culture International Magazine. So first of all, Thanks for your interest and thanks for having me in this panel. And on the specific question, uh, first, uh, I think uh, always people still question the importance of art and what is in it in art that, that transcends the roles. Uh, and the second, how can art press a message of universal trust and activate more open dialogue? Uh? So, as uh, indeed, so I think uh, answers uh, concerning the art mother could be elaborated if we deduce to know the human being in the difference the human being can have in essence similarities to understand, feel, think, and know. And from the first manifestations of the ancient world, even the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Baroque, modernity to our days, how many coincidences can we evidence for the creative act? No? So, uh, in this way, uh, human beings reproduce in mimetic process behaviors and feelings through artistic manifestation, regardless of the aesthetic criteria of evaluation or ideologies. The eternal presence values are significant. So works that cross time and continue to be contemplated, touching the observer sensibility. A public not specialized in art, but that perceives in image the values intrinsic in, to its human nature by feeling. So uh, in this way, also uh, further uh, uh, thinking about sensitivity. Uh, with greater intensity for some artists, less for others, is not in the context or at the time, but in the human being through time. And what is done with the feeling is that it's related to a context. No? And I think art is the reproduction, mimesis, of balance, reflection, understanding, happiness, joy, love, compassion, beauty and good feelings, as well as imbalance, irrationality, pain, unhappiness, and despair. This is what's happening now in Europe, in Ukraine. And in short, bad feelings, be it good or bad, uh, we perceive it as feelings, relationships in the sensitive world. That is aesthetic experience beyond the ideologies through art. And so it, this is the focus of my research in visual arts related to uh, human uh, values uh, beyond uh, political and ideology uh, point of view. And so I think uh, uh, I, you can, uh, the, the next can now speak and later I can pick a little, a little more. Absolutely. And, and I do think that and hearing a little bit more about your research will be really helpful too, as, as we're, as we're engaging more in this conversation. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I, I know that you and I are both the people that no one can see. So, but I think you're up next. I think you may have to unmute yourself. Um, let's see here if that. Let me unmute me. Great. Uh, yep. Yeah, perfect. Um, I, I seem to be the odd man out here. Um, you're all incredibly bright, incredibly articulate, and um, you're all scientists. I mean, you really are sort of exploring and, and, and excavating what is happening and, and the changes that are taking place. I'm a businessman. Uh, I started out in this field um, as a gallerist. 
uh, wanted to represent and, and sort of discover new artists, which I did for 20 years. I had my own gallery in New York. Um, and then I had a um, midlife crisis and got a job with a small company called Microsoft and spent the next six years building their art collection. Um, I think, so I'm always confused as exactly why I'm, I brought into these discussions, but maybe because I come from a kind of the sort of practical world. Uh, where I, I, you know, I have to sort of sell art or place art or arrange exhibitions, so on and so forth. But what I find interesting and what I find problematic right now is I went back to look at this question of the arts educating beyond national ideology. Do we, have we accepted, and this is because this is so much about America, have we accepted that we have an, a national ideology? And if we have accepted that, what is it? And if we don't have it defined, we must define it. Um, I'm in tears every day watching what's going on in Ukraine um, because I come from a family of refugees. And uh, 70 years ago, both sides of my family basically were thrown out of Europe and had to reconstruct their lives elsewhere. And I watched that as a child day by day. Um, so for me, the question is, is really, you know, how do we define this? And then and and then where do the arts come in? Where do the arts come into play in all of this? Um, because I think if you don't have, if you haven't defined the ide- ideology, the arts just seem to be sort of fluff. Um, and I don't know whether this is going to be a worthwhile uh, anecdote or not. When I was curator for Microsoft, one of the gifts that was given to Bill Gates was a section of the Berlin Wall. And I would give a monthly tour of the collection to visitors, to business people, what have you. And I remember one afternoon giving a group, giving having a group of, of students uh, to come to see um, the collection, and we were looking at this Berlin Wall, and I was talking about the wall, and I had a wall of a, a, a wall of blank faces. I mean, they had no idea what I was talking about, and it suddenly dawned on me that they were, of course, born after the Berlin Wall had been taken down. Now, I was old enough to actually witness it being built on television in nineteen whatever it was sixty two. Um, they had no idea what the wall was. And not only that, is that the wall symbolized those differences that they tried to instill, that there was a difference between the East and the West. This is the conflict we're having today. There ultimately is no difference because of the way we communicate, because the fact that the Internet and the Web and what have you doesn't allow for those walls. It takes away those boundaries, which gives us an entirely different world to deal with. Um, which is why I come back to the question, what is our national ideology? Because we are in a conflict in this country. Um, different groups are still struggling for identity, for uh, uh, independence, for economic uh, equality, uh, political equality. Um, I work with a number of women artists. Women artists have a harder time than male artists in this economy. It is a fact of life. I worked for many years with an artist named Jackie Ferrara. And Jackie and I have a joke. If her name had been Jack, she would be far richer than she is today. Um, in fact, I'm on a panel next week uh, talking about sort of the position and place of women right now in the, in the arts. I've worked with hundreds of women, and I, I, I just see what goes on. So that's a bunch of things happening uh, at once I'm talking about. But for me, the issue is, what is our national ideology? How are we going to define ourselves? in the future and how do we then work with other countries if we're going to be boundaryless thanks that's it for the moment I wonder if our moderator has frozen. Um, Maybe, possibly. Okay, well, I guess I guess I guess we'll just move on and keep talking. (laughs) Um, I I think that you know it's an interesting point, Michael. What is our so our ideology? You're talking about in the lens of the U.S., right? And we have Brazil represented here and, and other countries. You know, from my perspective, my limited vantage point, I do think that the ideology of the U.S. is in the eye of the beholder, and it's more so than ever. Um, there are factions, of course, in this country that um, have different 
uh, tenants that they're holding dear. I think it was much, much more apparent uh, with the Trump election and then, of course, the Biden election subsequently afterwards. There's certainly very much a different schism in this country. I think it also goes across Europe. It's not just in the U.S. Um, I think there's many reasons for it. But, you know, I think that art has always been a sort of a, a flag in the ground of power as well as creativity. You know, people who are looking to control a country. And it's interesting you mentioned Microsoft, right? Because Bill, his collection is fabulous, as you well know. I mean, he has the Lester Codex, uh, which in and of itself is one of the most hallmark pieces of art in the world and, and always will be, right? So I think art has always been this status symbol and the collection of important pieces like that dictate um the fact that you have a strong presence in the world and a strength in the world. And so I, I just wonder, you know, I, I would love to hear from everybody. What does that look like? Does that mean that we just move forward and art is a subsequent just representation of power and we create art and it's, it's amazing. But at the end of the day, if it's worth a lot of money, that's where people gravitate towards it because then they can show that they are worth something. Or, I mean, I don't know how that looks like long-term, especially when we become boundaryless supposedly, um, in decentralized worlds. I, I think it's it's a very strange pl- time to be alive <laughs> to see how this plays out. Hey, Alana, it's a really great question. I don't know if you can hear me if, if I'm back again or not. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> I jumped in for you. No, no, it's great. You, I, I, I think it's a great question to posit to the entire group. So um, and in some ways it dovetails into a question maybe I can ask uh, after that. But but I think it definitely would be great to hear how other people I'm not going to pick on anyone. I feel like that's rude. I feel like I'm just because one of the things that came to mind about ideology, unfortunately for the worst, is like the ideology of individualism, especially in regards to the United States. And I think that that is something I think about a lot, especially with, um, international exchange and fostering like community connections and and trying always to try to move beyond this feeling of individualism and um, individual superiority. That's that's great. Christian or Michael, any thoughts? Uh, yes. So uh, I would like uh, um, to extend uh, the term uh, nationalities. Uh, because uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, this uh, is concerned with what exists in the world and how to relate it to human beings' paradoxes, complexities, and idiosyncrasies through art. No? And on the other, uh, there have always questions thinking the relationship between all the dichotomies and especially between good and evil to find the best solution on a moral and ethical basis, uh, but uh, there were only different forms of answers for the same things in various configurations of art, uh, uh, in my point of view. Great. Michael, any thoughts? Michael? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, again, perfectly. I, I, I'm stuck on this idea of ideology because I'm 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 very aware of and 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 interested in the fact that we're in an incredible transition period. Um, we have politicians who want to lead the country down a path that I think we don't need to go down. Uh, whether they're banning books or they're banning, I was just reading today about a politician who's running for Senate in, in Florida. Uh, and the people, the bill is that they want to eliminate the word "gay" from any any context um, in in political or or in, in anything that's published. Um, there are all these strange I, ideas about ideology that are sort of manifesting themselves in the country, and at some point, this sort of has to come out so that we actually form and we create an ideology that is incredibly inclusive, and that we're proud of, and that we can actually be, stand behind. Um, and I think that we're just in a in a huge quandary right now as to what that's going to be, because we have 
uh, we have an old guard that's dying out and a new guard that's trying to figure out how to set us go forward. And does any of that make sense? I don't know, but it, it's it's something that I'm sort of struggling with and looking at myself um, simply because I've crossed what I call an important threshold. I've just now turned 70. So for me, the big producing years are gone and now I have another, another you know, sort of 10 years, if I'm lucky, to produce and do the things that I want to do. But the, the so my idea personal ideology is changing, but the but what I'm witnessing is a kind of questioning of ideology of of who we are, what we represent, what's important. Uh, someone earlier was talking about the fact that you know that art has become so much connected to finance um, that the passion, the excitement, the love, the curiosity, all the things that 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 make drew me to art are being negated because everybody's worried about how much it's worth or is going to be worth more, more tomorrow. So this is a problem and I don't know how to resolve that problem. Um, but the, but for me, the, the notion of a shared ideology is hugely important that we are. And that's an ideology that we then can carry over to other people, not to dominate them, but to share with them. You know, it's like learning to eat different foods and, or learning another language. You want to enjoy all of that. You don't want to sort of say mine is better than yours. There isn't such a thing. You know, I, I wonder if I, in some ways, stemming from, from what everyone's responses were and uh, for uh, Alana for having this last question, I, I'm wondering about this idea of accessibility, um, and because I think accessibility becomes a really interesting phenomenon that I think especially we're looking at through a cultural lens, um, and, you know, um, especially at this moment in time, especially after what we've learned over the past two years. Um, and I start to wonder about from each one of your individual practices is that how do you start to see issues regarding accessibility being shaped and changed by um, by the the past two years, and especially within the realm of cultural practice and the generation of culture, um, uh, and in and I guess kind of understanding kind of what are some of the opportunities and implications uh, that you see regarding the sphere of accessibility as it relates to this idea of kind of national identities. Maybe I, I can start. I when I sold my first startup, I was taking time off and I got certified, I was certified to sell rare books at NYU. I was you know, okay, what do I show you with my time? Oh, I'll just do this. This is awesome. Hooray. So I went to NYU and I got my certification and I thought it was super fun. Every rare books for the most part, conference, gathering, the Grolier Club, all of it had a very specific demographic um, for the most part, economic demographic, um, gender demographic, social demographic. We all went to the same schools. We all, you know, it, it was very much a closed society because it was a, a luxury to collect rare books. People don't do that normally unless they're bibliophiles and like love uh, printing and, and the printing, all the things. Fast forward to now in the crypto space, creation of NFTs, the most popular NFTs, even to this day, were cartoons cartoons that younger people could collect and they represented passes to a community. So there are examples, Board Ape Yacht Club, um, Crypto Kitties, that, that was the first, one of the first collections. And they weren't just pieces of art or pieces of uh, fundamental cartoon renderings. They were, you were belong to, belonging to a club. You get to go to gatherings and both virtual and physical. You have merch to show that you're part of this like super amazing, whichever club it was, club. And the Board Ape Yacht Club in particular has gotten taken off in spades. Like the traders and Wall Street Bets and others, they're all buying apes to, to show their representation, to show their personalities. And so, you know, the dichotomy between those two examples is that in the rare books example, it was super closed. No one really knew what the heck we were doing. No one really seemed to care what we were doing because it was a very niche collectability um, conversation versus now where this, these, these collections and, you know, we can debate how uh, artistically. It's seven o'clock. It's seven o'clock. <laughs> artistically um, sophisticated they are, but like, they've opened up a whole conversation around art that people haven't been having for a very long time. It's mainstream. It's really interesting. Well, it's interesting the way you describe that because I grew up and came to 
to the business world or came to the art world in, in the early 70s. The early 70s in Soho are complete. It's it's so far from where we are today. I, I, it's it's almost in, impossible to describe. Um, it, it was it was a small community. It was a tight community. Um, there was a. It, I don't know. I guess those are the best ways to describe it. I mean, you saw people all the time, and, but it, and it was a pretty close knit community. Um, and then it all started to, when I left New York, it started to, it was making changes and, and the art world is completely different now. I mean, at the time, in those days, there were maybe two art fairs. Now I don't know how many art fairs there are, maybe a hundred art fairs, maybe 200 art fairs, and they're all over the world. And you could spend, you could spend all day or all your whole life just traveling from country to country, visiting and seeing art fairs. Um, but the, the, um, the problem that I see is accessibility is that we still are not allowing every group to participate. Um, it's still, there's still blockages. Uh, in fact, next week's discussion is with a art historian, museum director, friend of mine has just published a book on Florian Stedheimer that's gotten rave reviews. And yet she will not work in the museum world anymore because of the politics involved with the museum world. And the fact that curators don't make decisions, board members make decisions because they want to show their collection. They don't want to let, you know, so, and this is a, this is a far cry from the world that she and I both got involved in and developed because curators were, were, were expected to find new artists and to, and to develop new artists and to be part of a dialogue with new artists that doesn't exist anymore. One of the other issues that she and I will explore is the fact that in those days, there were exactly two museum directors in the whole United States that were women. Now it's a completely different world. Um, so, and then, and, and now you have an African American community that's finally coming and saying, Hey, yo, where are we? Where do we fit in? You know, why are we not being, why are we being excluded and have been? Um, so there's just the, all of this, you know, is I think incredibly important, but I also think it's very difficult to to sort of for it to all kind of come together i mean there's just a lot of dialogue a lot of a lot of struggle that's going to happen i think for for at least another generation or two until we sort all this all of this out but i think what i find um good and positive is that it's happening um i think that um we still have lessons to learn we have not learned enough about what went down with the pandemic as a country, how to deal with this. We, it's divided us, which I never thought it would, and it's really divided us. The situation in Ukraine is, again, dividing us. How do we resolve those kind of problems on those issues? Um, anyway, so I, I, I'm, I have to put a, a positive spin on things. Otherwise, I'd be depressed 24 hours a day. But I think that from the sound of what you are working on, it's interesting, is that... Um, you're in the trenches and you're really doing the work. You know, I'm the person at the other end who's going to say, Hey, can we move this? Can we sell this? Can we find a show for this? But I think what's interesting is what you're doing, which is is ultimately going to produce the change that we, that we ultimately need. Um, there we go. Thanks, Michael. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Anna. I was just going to say, I mean, I think what's interesting about what both Alana and Michael um, speak about is they're talking about, there are many different art worlds to talk about too, I think. And um, one thing that I saw emerge in San Francisco is first of all, a lot of institutions closing and a lot of mutual aid that was um, propelled by artists selling their work. And it was really amazing. And it wasn't just localized to San Francisco, of course, this happened all over the world. And I even saw it when I was in Kyrgyzstan most recently. And I thought that that was also just a small and interesting segue into accessibility, because it was a lot of work by amazing people that did not need validation, obviously, from these larger institutions. Um, and it was sold at very affordable prices in the name of like helping one another. That was the other thing I want to just chime in with. Well, well I, th I think that I think there are many different kind of art worlds. I think what's important is that um, they see they also recognize they need to protect each other and they need to support each other. Um, I, it bothers me, for example, that some artists who I've known and who've done extremely well are not busy with supporting younger artists or supporting some some enterprise that would really 
you know, sort of benefit somebody, whether it's an artist who needs health care, whether it's an artist who needs housing or what have you. I mean, it seems to me that that really is something that needs to be drilled in that, you know, if you've been so successful, you really do need to help. And, um, and I've seen, I've seen it not happening and I find it bothersome. Thanks, Michael. Christian, I want to make sure you get a chance. So um, I think uh, uh, we talk about uh, democratization, democratization of art, né? the approach to democratic ideals né? based on the relationship between art, technique and industry and its creative conception and the culture influences on its practice, as uh, Michael already said, in economic, social and also political development. Né? So, uh, and also thinking about our uh, moment now, so 21st century, na? human to present itself in its cultural diversity as a planetary reality on the tutelage of technology and science, na? as Alana uh, described it. Na? And, but even though such facilities, so, closeness and in a single reality humanity does not cease to be diverse and with the need for an illusion and for creations and so many other artistic achievements have made it possible in its continuity so for me art has always participated in public life and artists have ever formed a reality for the collective experience. So as aesthetic experience uh, for, not uh, specifically for people that are specialized in art, but for the general public also. So that's my last words for this panel, perhaps, <laughs> because I, I don't know if I have time. Well, you know, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to see if I can get one more kind of round of of thoughts from everyone. And and part of I guess the question I'm I'm, I'm thinking about is in relationship to Annie something that you were saying uh, in your introduction, uh, which is also just talking about some of these substances that really defy you know transnational borders um, and are inherently borderless. And so, on one hand, we're looking at the commodification of of cultural practice, but we're also looking at the definitions of these things um, that are inherently stateless, right? And 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 I feel like we're opening up possibly a can of worms that we shouldn't try to answer in you know seven minutes, but we'll, you know we'll we'll try to open the door at least. Um, and it and it makes me think uh, of this. Uh, it makes me think of um, of so much of our world is now consumed with a critical awareness of issues regarding sustainability and the environment. Um, and the forest fire in Manitoba that makes the air quality in Minneapolis um, seem similar to that of Beijing uh, wow. cares little for transnational boundaries. Um, in the same way that we start to see uh, uh, the number of armed conflicts that are fought over natural resources like water, uh, like uh, um, you know, um, oil. Uh, like oil, exactly. And so I think, you know, I think I'd love to go ahead and get everyone's take on the lens of as we're starting to think about. Uh, national identities or 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 stateless identities um, in its relationship to the idea of sustainability. I'm I'm always thinking about this. I think it's one of the easiest ways to witness our interdependence is because like water, air, light, they don't care about national ideologies or borders. And I'm always interested in the porosity of the body because all of these things are moving through us and our wellness is completely intertwined and dependent on the wellness of the river that's near you, you know, and that river is dependent on many other things. And so the more in my work, at least the more I can point to that, the more I feel that we're able to look at ourselves as beyond these, these borders and national ideologies. I, um, I watched a program several years ago about kindergarten that takes place in Germany and the, and the kids, basically, the kindergarten is outdoors as much as possible. And they learn about nature, about dirt, about bugs, about flowers and plants. And I think for me, if I could start again, I'd like to start there. I'd like to know about all those. I'd like to understand the water is needed for this. I would like to understand 
um, all those natural things that we take for granted in the, as the 21st century, you know, sort of cosmopolitan, but are hugely important. You know, the quality of air. Uh, I live in upstate New York. We've had a terrible winter. Um, not so much because of the snow, but because of the cold. I mean, every morning when I let the dog out, it's zero degrees. I mean, it's just completely nuts, which means that the the heating bill is higher this year than it was last year, which means the fuel costs are higher. I mean, it, it's it's also, you know, sort of tied in. But for me, again, um, education, and, but starting – with kids that's really understanding as you were describing it every every effect that nature has on us breathing the quality of light i mean all of those things um there was an article today in the paper about improving one's one's um one's life and sitting in the sun the first five minutes in the morning is a good start you know i've been doing that my whole life i mean there's nothing better than you know coffee in the sunshine i mean but um but these are the things that I think we need to we need to go back and look at and and then and and also realize that they're gifts. We have to protect them. You know, I I I I didn't know something about about a fire in, in Manitoba, but um, you know, yeah. it, it was it was interesting. Whenever the fires were in California last year, um, we woke up one morning and we could smell the smoke in New York right. State, and that was very yeah. strange. Michael, I, I and I appreciate that. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Chris John. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, go Hi. ahead and weigh in before. Hi. I think they just they jerk out the rug on you on this. So okay. So uh, I think uh, on designing for sustainability is also interesting because uh, so aesthetic, social, and urban solutions for a new world field is important also. Art, architecture, and design are challenging activities that can transform culture, society, and nature through technology. And these are human, human actions shaping the world and forcing us to overcome earthly concerns related to the new human condu condition. As we all know nowadays, uh, the Anthropocene, well, that's my last word. Fantastic, thank you, Alana. Sure, I, I love that. I think that was really beautiful. Um, I, I'll just say to, to close, I total, I definitely agree that the 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 notion of valuing resources, especially amongst children, is so important. And I think COVID had the the benefit. <laughs> one of the only benefits of COVID was that the idea of open space and being safe outside became very much important to children. I have five children. And so wow. during COVID, it was very difficult to do anything. Um, and it led us to buy a farm in LA. We have two acres in Los Angeles, which is crazy. Um, and we live and we're building a farm and we're, we're, we're planting. I'm a New Yorker, so planting things. I'm probably going to kill all of it the first time, but we'll try. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I never thought, I used to live in apartments. And I, I loved apartments. And I loved like living in a, a very uh, urban world. And because of COVID and my children, we're learning about nature. We're learning about what's valuable, how to grow things, what it looks like to be part of the world from a very base level. And I think that's really important because you can create art that way. My daughter weaves um, grass and sticks together and creates rugs and she's nine, you know, and so she would never have done that ordinarily. That would never be part of her world. So I think it's an interesting time to, for, for a child to be part of our world. Thank you, and, and that's in some ways such a, a great way, uh, in a in a in a in an optimistic way to go ahead and, and start to wrap things up here. And you know, we've got we've got one minute left. Um, you know, I was fortunate to um, to those that are joining us. I was fortunate to uh, to be in a prep call w with uh, everyone here um, um, before before our conversation. And I have to say, we you know we're all in agreement that uh, forty five minutes just gets to the introduction of of this deep topic. I think. Uh, you know, we we didn't talk about you know uh, you know NFTs as much as we could have. We didn't talk about kind of Web three. We didn't talk about kind of the environment and 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 work that's being produced. Um, and and so I think that really the goal here is to have this be a point of departure. Uh, that there are so many uh, there are so many different ways that we can start to think about how how this work can evolve. Um, and really, I do think uh, it's it's going to be through conversations like these that we start to get a clear uh, underpinning in terms of what we're able to accomplish 
uh, as well as I think uh, the types of work that needs to be pushed uh, and, and the way that we go ahead and, and the type of scholarship that may exist now, but really needs to exist in more certainty in the future. So um, with that, I guess I'm going to thank, I'm going to thank my panelists, uh, Alana, Chris, John, uh, Annie, and Michael, just for, for their thoughtfulness. Uh, and, and hopefully you'll see us and we can extend this conversation at a future time. So uh, thanks everyone. And thanks everyone for uh, listening in today. Thank, Thank you. you all. It's sure. conversation. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Bye. Take care. Have a good weekend, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Have a nice.